Amen, amen. So the title of today's sermon is More Than Tradition. Elbow your neighbor and say, this is more than a tradition. This is more than a tradition because Palm Sunday, like I said, it's different. It's different because it's weighty. There is a weightiness to Palm Sunday when we really, really focus in. Now, there's a difference between weightiness and heaviness, right? I'm not talking about heaviness. I am talking about a significance. It is an honor that happens when we understand what Palm Sunday is. It's a tradition that we should be upholding, right? You hear us talk about traditions that sometimes we have these traditions that we just do because it's passed down from generation to generation or there are these things that we do and we have no idea why we do them, right? Anybody have any of those that you're like, why do I do that? But then we have these traditions. I, it totally reminded me, I have a friend that when they leave the room, they turn the light off once and then they go back and they, they turn it on and they turn it off again. And then they leave the room and then they go back and then they, they turn it on and they turn it off again. They just want to make sure that they really got that light switch off. That's one of those things that we do that we don't quite know why we do it. Some of you just looked at the person sitting next to you and shook your head. I'm so sorry for that. But there, there are traditions that we have to uphold and this is one of them. Because the culture works so hard to diminish the value of the cross. The culture in which we live works so hard to make the cross irrelevant to the lives that we live today. And as Christians, y'all, I'm going to come in hot today because as Christians, this should be our mission to teach the generations that are to come about the power of the cross, not just the tradition of the cross, but the power of the cross. There is so much importance in that because family, if we don't teach them, if the church doesn't teach them, the world's going to teach them. And the world is going to teach them a perverted version of truth that says, ah, cross is just something that you wear around your neck. Cross is just something you tattoo someplace and then you never think about it again. There's nothing wrong with a cross tattoo or a cross necklace if you understand the power of the cross. And it is our mission as believers to be training and understanding about that power. And we have to remember our why in that, just like that light switch. Sometimes, maybe if you came in with a family member or if you got kids or you have a spouse, sometimes you have to remember why you love them, right? Right? Sometimes you have to remember why you chose that spouse on certain days because in the middle of that process, sometimes the journey gets a little difficult, right? You guys can giggle there. It's okay. Even the person that's sitting next to you thinks you're difficult at times. So it's okay. It's okay. It's really okay. But it's important that we remember why. Palm Sunday is a tradition because of the history and the purpose that it holds. Y'all, it's Jesus' journey to the cross. This is the beginning of his journey to the cross. This is the beginning of Holy Week, like Pastor Daniel just said, but it's also the start to his last week on earth, and that should be significant to us. Just out of curiosity, and you can raise your hand or not raise your hand, but how many of you know when and how your families, your ancestors actually came to the U.S. How many of you actually know the story of how you got here in the United States? It's amazing when we actually take a journey back to understand that. Maybe it was a long time ago. Maybe it wasn't that long ago. Maybe it was a rough journey. Maybe it wasn't a rough journey. But it is so important knowing where you come from because knowing what it cost knowing what that journey was, it changes your perspective, changes the way that you look at things. When you know somebody that knows where they come from, they walk in a different level of gratitude. They walk in a different understanding of, no, this cost somebody something. This wasn't just given to me. I have the hardest time with our kiddos when we give them gifts and they go, thanks. And then they just walk off and they go, no, 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 no. You know what that cost? Do you know what that do you know how many children haven't been getting that gift even out of our own? Like our fourth kiddo, we buy him things that we didn't buy for any of the other three. And we literally think, well, you better understand just how much we waited through three kids to give that gift. Like this is a big deal. 
the big kids go, oh, we never got anything like that. Like, why does Fox get that? And we go, well, he's the last one. So we give him all the things. But when you understand what it costs, you have a different perspective on it. It's so important. Tradition, a right tradition, a healthy tradition is meant to connect us to something. It is meant to bring stability. It's kind of like a, a three-legged race. Y'all know what a three-legged race is, right? It's when, oh my golly, nobody raised their hands. Does anybody know what, a, does anyone do field days anymore? Like what, what are we talking about? Three-legged race, two people, the two people in the middle, their, their middle legs are tied together, right? So they have to figure out how to run uh, in connection. After all the last two weeks of meatloaf conversations, I almost asked Pastor Daniel to come up here and demonstrate a three-legged race. I was this close, family. I was this close. You cook one bad meatloaf, and 20 years later, it's still being talked about. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And he never even mentioned, I was making substitutions in the recipe, too. So it's not my fault. I got one off. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm healing and I'm walking through the journey with you all. It's personal. It's personal when you get to listen to your, your husband preach about you every single week. He's very sweet. He is very sweet, typically, except for when we talk about meatloaf. However, we're going to walk through the significant points from this day from Palm Sunday today, because what I think is so interesting about the um, testimonies of Palm Sunday in the word of God is you can find Palm Sunday told in all four gospels. You can find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the same telling of the same moment. It's so powerful. And the reason that this became such a moment in history was because a prophecy was spoken to the Israelites hundreds of years before, and they remembered it. They held on to it. They passed it down from generation to generation. It's like when you tell your children you're going to get a treat later on today. They don't forget it. <laughs> They're going to remind you. They're going to ask about it over and over and over again. They will do everything in their power to keep that alive in your memory because they want to make sure it's happening. The Israelites were the same. They were like, this is happening. A prophecy has been spoken. This is going to happen. So you can find that prophecy in Zechariah 9, verse 9, and we're going to go there together today. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, a baby donkey at that. So this is the prophecy that they were told hundreds of years before. So they know that a Messiah is coming and they know he's coming in on a donkey and they've been talking about this for so long. So then we catch Jesus and he's on his way to Jerusalem, right? Before he gets to Jerusalem, before this Palm Sunday moment, he's on his way. He's going for um, Passover, which is going to be the Last Supper. And like I said, this is the beginning to Holy Week. So this is the first day. This is the week where Judas betrays him with a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the week. This is the day where the shouts of the followers of the disciples of Christ turned from save me to crucify him on Friday. Switched from savior to get rid of that guy. He's no good. No good to Good Friday. That was on Good Friday. This is the beginning of that week. This is the week that ends in Resurrection Sunday. So Jesus, he's on his way and he stops in a town called Bethpage, which is essentially like a suburb of Jerusalem. And something that is so important to this journey is we know that Jesus came in on a donkey, right? Everybody know that Jesus came in on Palm Sunday on a donkey. But the important part of this is it wasn't like he'd been traveling and traveling and traveling and he was worn out and he was like, oh, that thing over there will do. I'm exhausted. Somebody bring me that mule. No, he, he specifically requested a donkey. And you'll see that if you look with me at the book of Luke chapter 19, verses 30 and 31. It says, where he said to his disciples, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Meaning this is a colt that is, it's pure. It hasn't been taught wrong. It hasn't been broken wrong. It is a pure, very young donkey. 
And he says, untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Now, it's important to note that up to this point, he's never announced himself. He's never said, I am the Messiah. He's never been out there right in front. All along, he's been speaking in riddle, telling them about the Messiah. But in this moment, he says, the Lord needs it. So this is the first time that he kind of clues them in. And then if you look at the full story with me in Mark chapter 11, this is the passage we're going to keep coming back to over and over throughout this message. But it's verses 7 through 10, and it says, When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, What? Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They were shouting, they were celebrating. So there are four key points that I want to focus our attention on today in this passage. Say there's just four. There's just four of them. So the first one I want you to write down in your notes, write the donkey. The donkey. The donkey is one of the most obvious parts. I can't think of a donkey without hee-hawing. Can, I just can't. It's the funniest sound I think any animal makes. And the donkey gets to make it. But the donkey is such an important part of this story. So again, if we break that passage back down, if we look at verse 7, it says, When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. So Jesus has this big announcement to make. This is announcement day. Like this is biggest announcement of all time kind of announcement. We like big announcements, right? We like to make big, big deals about when we've got something to announce. This was the announcement of all time. Like this was the baby gender reveal party like you'd never seen before moment. This was it. This was the greatest announcement that ever could be made, but he chose a donkey, he chose a donkey to do it on. He chose a baby donkey at that. So a smaller one, even smaller, not like a big, like statuesque donkey here. No, he chose a little one, like a baby, a little guy, one that looked probably, if I was imagining it, probably looked like he was maybe going to squash it. Like just a little, a little donkey is what he chose. But the reason for that is because in this time, when kings were entering a city, they came in in two ways. When they were coming in through the city gate, when they were making their entrance into the city, they came in one of two ways. They came in on a big horse, like I said, like statuesque. I try to make my presence big, but I don't know that I'm getting it across. They came in like macho. I'm on a horse. And this means that this is a time of war. I'm showing that I'm tough. I'm showing that I'm brave. Or some of you men are kind of chuckling within yourselves when I try to make myself big. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was either the horse or the second way that they came in was if it wasn't a time of war, they would come in on a donkey, which meant this is a time of peace. So Jesus chose to come in on a donkey because the donkey symbolized peace. The donkey symbolized humility and the donkey symbolized the everyday people. See, the thing that I love about Jesus, all so many things that I love about Jesus, but Jesus wasn't there to impress. He was saying to them, I don't need to impress you. I don't need to come in here and show you how amazing I am. I'm here for the everyday people. I'm not here for the Pharisees. I'm not here for the Sadducees. I'm not here for the ones that say, I've got to do it just like this. I am here for the people, and I am here to show that to you. He wasn't there to find favor. He was there to bring favor. And from the donkey today, I think we can all learn humility. Family, the donkey teaches us humility. Nobody likes a lesson in humility, though. We don't, we don't, like, we don't like it. It's not, a, it's not a fun lesson. But you can find in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, it says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus chose to reveal himself in humility. He had 
the answers in life. How many of you have ever been in a moment where somebody's asking a question and you're like, no, 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 I, I actually know that. Like, stop asking somebody else. Like, I have that answer. No, stop talking. Like, I, I really have that answer. That, that's how we function in life, right? Jesus had the answers. He was literally the answer to every problem that they had, every struggle that they had, every issue that they had. And yet he still chose to present himself humbly. And I don't know about you, but I think of this moment and I think like Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Like if I'm coming in with that kind of announcement, the Messiah kind of announcement, I'm coming in on a float that I just had a whole lot of people build, right? There's a band. There's like people blowing trumpets all around. There's probably dancers, appropriate dancers. And there would be (laughs) big balloons that are like building size, right? This is what I think this moment looks like but not Jesus. Why? Because in Matthew 20, verse 28, it says, for even the son of man came not to be what? Served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Family, every single thing that Jesus said and did was for you and for me. Every single thing that he said and did I think we live lives where we have moments of kindness, moments of generosity, moments of thoughtfulness. Every single moment that Jesus lived and breathed, he was thinking of us. It was intentionally for for us. And he wanted to make that so clear to us. When you look at Zechariah 9 verse 9, the prophecy that I just read to you, when it says that he was lowly riding on a donkey, That word lowly in the Hebrew, when it pertains to kings, it means gracious and merciful. He wanted us to know and remember more than anything, his mercy and his grace. Because he knew we were going to mess up. He knew we were going to miss it. Sometimes we spend our life like, ah, I can't believe I messed up. He wasn't surprised. He wasn't surprised because he came with grace and mercy for that moment. And if he is our model, and he is, family, then every single thing we say and do should be for who? For others, for other people, just like Jesus. Romans 12 verse 10 says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above who? Above yourselves. And Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in what? Humility. I'm going to make y'all read today, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Family, the lesson from the donkey is very simple. It's a question. Will you choose humility in your life, in your day-to-day life, in your relationships? Will you choose humility? Because there's great blessing in it, if you will. That's the lesson from the donkey. The next thing I want to focus on today is the cloak. Say the cloak. And I know half of you have no idea even what a cloak is because it's not exactly cloak weather out there, is it? It's not. But if we look back at that same passage at Mark 11, verse 8, it says many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches that they had cut in the field. So what is it? What is a cloak specifically? I'm sure some of you have an educated guess, but essentially it was the most valuable and useful piece of clothing that they owned in this time. It was their outer coat. It was long and they were all very, very different, but it was very special. It was essentially like Pastor Daniel's J's. I mean, it was special. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. Okay, except for, except for the cloak was also the most useful piece of clothing that they owned. And he can't even crease his shoes. Like he can't even bend down without making sure that he gets down there carefully. Meatloaf. It's okay. I, touching on your J's doesn't even come close to the meatloaf. Doesn't even come close to it. Because I'll still be nice to the J's because I value them. However, however... The cloak was so significant because one, yes, 
It was so costly. It was the most expensive item that they owned, yes. But two, it also represented status. So it literally told people, it told people like what I'm worth. What I'm wearing on the outside, everybody, everybody's wearing a cloak. Everybody wears a cloak. But what, um, what I can spend on this cloak, it shows. So everybody knows how much I've got. And then it also identified a person's authority and it told who they were. So dependent upon the role that they played in life, their cloak was very different. So these cloaks, they were a big deal, such a big deal, so much of a big deal that in this time, whenever you were owed a debt by somebody, you could just go and take it, okay? You could literally just go and take it from them. It was like early days mafia. They were like, that's mine, I'm taking it back, okay? But not the cloak, not the cloak. According to Mosaic law, you could take whatever you needed to take. You could pay yourself back just a little bit, but you could not touch the cloak. You could take whatever, but you were not allowed, according to the law, to touch a man or a woman's cloak because it represented their dignity. In the time period, that cloak represented somebody's dignity. So to lay down their cloaks, family, That scripture said that they took off their cloaks. These things that I just defined to you in great detail were very significant. They took them off their backs and they laid them on the ground for a donkey to walk on. They saw this as such a significant moment. Why? Because this was the prophesied king. And this meant that they were submitting to his rule as king. When they laid down that cloak, they said, I submit to you. Right now you are the king and I am, I'm just here to receive whatever you have. They were humbly surrendering themselves. Family, that's personal. This was a personal moment. It was a public moment and it was a personal moment. How many of you have been that personal with the Lord in your relationship recently? You don't have to raise your hand. I am asking you to check your heart for a moment. Have you viewed your relationship with the Lord that personally lately? Because it is a personal relationship that we have with God and we have the access to it. It's so important that we see that. The cloak teaches us surrender. The cloak teaches us surrender. And just like humility family, we don't like to surrender. We don't. That's why we drive crazy in Houston. And then we make excuses for it later. Like he always says, we're not so nice in the car. We get out of the car and we're like, hey, everything's right with the world. Because in Houston, we make the exception that we can seem insane. But we're really fine when we get out of the car because we don't like to surrender, right? I'm beating you and you and you and you and you to the next H-E-B, right? (laughs) Nobody's going to beat me there. We don't like to surrender. Humility is not something we're great at. But I also think it's because we don't understand what surrender really means. Proverbs 23 verse 26 says, My son, give me your heart. And let your eyes observe my ways. Give me your heart. I can't read this scripture without it making me pause. Because I think so often we don't even really understand what that means. To just truly surrender means we give him our heart. We give him the things that matter to us. We take the things to him that are heavy on us. And we follow him his way of doing things. That's part two of that verse. Part one, we give him our heart. Part two, we observe his ways. We do things God's way. Say, we're supposed to do it God's way. We're supposed to do it God's way. So when we surrender, we surrender our control. Control is another hard one. But when we do, we trust him to lead. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because what? He cares for you. So much of the time we have difficulty trusting people because we don't really know who cares for us. Because one minute somebody can say they care for us and the next minute they take it back. One minute they show us that they're there for us, and then the next minute they just don't show up. 
So it is so easy for us to have issues and difficulties with trust, but that's not our God. That's people. We cannot project onto God the way that people make us feel because he is all sovereign. Everything that he does is with us in mind. We can trust him because his word says that he cannot tell a lie and that he never changes. And if he sent his son Jesus to the cross so long ago because he cared for us, does he still care for us today? Yes, he does. The lesson from the cloak today is a simple question again. What have you not surrendered? What have you not surrendered? What is that thing that you have been holding onto that keeps you from trusting in the Lord? What is that thing that you have said, ah, everything else, God, but not this. This is too personal. This would cost too much if it got messed up. What have you not surrendered? Family Palm Sunday is a day of revelation. This is a day where we say, okay, wait a minute. I know that we've been, we've been running this play. We have been living this life as a Christian. We've been doing this and doing that. But this is a day where we say, no, no, no. I got to shake off the old rhythms and I've got to find the freshness of the cross. I have to find the purpose behind why I'm surrendered to God. I have to find the joy in following after Jesus. This is a day for eyes to be opened. This is a day for us to be able to see his heart for us. It's significant. The third thing that I want to talk about today. So we started with the donkey. Then we had the cloak. And now we're going to do another obvious one. My favorite lightsaber. The palm. Today we're talking about the palm in this third moment. Again, if we go back to the verse that we just read, it's verse eight. It says, many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread branches they'd cut in the fields. So John described those branches as palm branches. Some had palm branches, some had palm leaves, but either way, they were essentially palms. And these palm branches historically symbolize goodness and victory. So when these people were throwing out their palms, they were like, yes, this is it. This is the day. This is the day of the victory that we talked about. And they were so excited in that moment. What we don't realize in that moment is that right at that moment, when they threw down those palm branches, Jesus didn't have to prove his worth to them. They just knew his promise. That all changed soon though. But in that moment, they knew his promise, and he didn't have to prove anything. He could ride in on a donkey. They knew the promise, and they were standing on it. But it shifted. It shifted a little bit later on. But there was another revelation, another prophecy that we see in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. And it says, after this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes with what? Palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. The palm branch represented victory. Family, I need you to realize that his presence means victory. When Jesus is present, your victory is present. That's a big one. And I hope you all are getting that and you realize that his presence means victory for you, for me. It is his presence that brings our victory. And it is so simple. The palm teaches us to honor his presence, his presence. Our victory is in his presence. I hope y'all hear me say these words. These words make me so excited because we miss so often that that is where the victory is, is in his presence. But family, he's always present. Are you Are you always present? Because the thing that we get to learn from the palm here today is, do you recognize his presence? Do you recognize that God is always present in your life? God is always on the scene. God is always there when the bottom falls out. God is always there to see that you need a solution. God is always there when you're grieving. God is always there when you're in pain. But do you see the victory in his presence? Or do you just see 
the struggle. Because he's not the struggle. He's the solution for the struggle. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I don't want to smack anybody around with my peaceful palm branch today, but I really, really hope you get it. In this moment, the Israelites expected his presence to mean their victory. And they were right. But there's a final component to this story. And that's the last part. And that's the praise. The last part is the praise. If we look back at the ninth and 10th verses, Mark 11, nine and 10, it says those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This was a day of celebration, and they knew it. They were so relieved. Prophecies had spoken of this moment, this Savior, and they were sick of Roman rule. They were like, yeah, finally, finally, somebody is going to come beat these Romans out of here for us. Somebody is going to win for us. They were so excited. So their deliverer had to be there to kick the Romans out, right? That was all they could see. All they could see was that their deliverance was coming from the Romans. Jesus was coming to remove the Romans, and that would be their victory. And they were ecstatic about it. But the issue was, that was what they wanted. They didn't know what they needed. They only saw what they wanted. They didn't know what they needed. If you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They saw what they wanted. They didn't know what they needed. They had plans for the short term, but God had plans for generations to come. Anybody ever made a plan and you realize looking back, okay, God, you were, you were in a longer term goal than I was. I just wanted to win in the moment. You were trying to make me win for a long, long, long time. Amen. They wanted, they wanted freed from the bondage of the Romans. And God wanted to free them from all bondage. God wanted to free them from the bigger picture. When we look at Proverbs 19, verse 21, it says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. When they shouted, Hosanna, what that meant in the Hebrew and the Greek was, save me. They were shouting, save me. But it wasn't how they expected him to save them. So they stopped believing. That's the, that's the painful part of Palm Sunday. They celebrated him one day and a couple days later when he didn't do it the way that they wanted him to do it, they stopped believing and turned on him. We don't like to look at this part of it because we don't like to realize we do the same thing so much. Family praise teaches us gratitude. Praise teaches us that if we choose to praise in the moments of frustration, we will see that there are still good things that God is doing in our lives. If we choose to praise in the moment that we are walking through the difficult things, we will see that God is still fighting for us. He's fighting battles that we don't see or understand. We will see him in the midst of it. Gratitude reminds us that he has good plans. Say good plans. Psalm 28 verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. The lesson from the praise family is not a simple question at all. It's, will you doubt his goodness as soon as his plan is different from yours? Will you doubt his goodness as soon as his plan is different from yours? Or will you choose to praise in the midst of it? Because when you praise, you will find a heart of gratitude because to trust means to rejoice even when there is unknown. We seek his presence and we celebrate his promise, family. Palm Sunday is weighty because of the cross and because of the sacrifice, but there is great joy set aside for us. There is great promise for the same reason. 
Jesus' entry into Holy Week reminds us to choose humility. It reminds us to choose surrender. It reminds us to choose to honor his presence and receive our victory in the middle of it. Chooses helps us to choose gratitude and praise in spite of what things look like, but what we expect in faith. I want you all to stand with me today. As we make a choice today to recognize that Palm Sunday is a day to shake off what's old and a day to say, God, I surrender afresh and anew. I felt like there was no way to wrap this service than for us to praise together. Can we just praise the Lord together just for a moment? Can we welcome? Amen. Can we welcome the worship team back just for a moment? They're going to lead us in a quick chorus. And then we're going to close the service. But I want us to make a proclamation together. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. And I pray that as we choose to praise in the midst of it, that a gratitude would spring forth in us and excitement to spread the gospel, to spread your good news, Father, and to rejoice because you are the risen Lord. And we are so thankful, God. With every head bowed and every eye closed today, I want to remind you that when we surrender, when we say, God, I trust you, it's because you came to save us, not just our moment, but all of the moments, all of the moments you came to save. And Father, if there is anyone in this place, I just ask you that you would draw their hearts right now. If you have never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I want to give you an opportunity. Or maybe you have asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life and you have turned away from him and you need to take a moment today to recommit, to resurrender your life. There is a good, good God that loves you. And if in this message today, you were reminded that my life has been out of order. I have been living a life for myself. I have not surrendered my life to Jesus, maybe ever. If you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, there is forgiveness for you. There is redemption for you. And the word says in Romans 10, that all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord and you will be saved. So if you are in this place and you would like to ask Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, or if you want to rededicate your life today, would you simply just lift your hand right here in this place all across the room right now? I see you there. I see you there. I see you back there. I see you there. I see you back in the back. Family, can we celebrate today those that have surrendered their lives to the Lord? Thank you, Lord. I see you over there. And could we all just pray this simple prayer together. Say, Father, today is the day I surrender my life and I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. 
I thank you that you forgive me. I thank you that you cleanse me. I thank you that you are my redeemer. In the mighty name of Jesus, I receive you as Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen.